uh, is something uh, with which I have a personal connection because in 1959, at Christmas time, I came back from my sophomore year at Pomona College to find my architect father gleeful because he had received a letter from the psychologist uh, at uh, UC Berkeley uh, when he was part of the study that, that uh, Pierre Luigi was going to talk about. Uh, and they had uh, done a so psychological profile of my father and decided that he shouldn't have been an architect, but it should have been a missionary. <laughs> and uh, I always remembered that. And many, many years later, I heard that one of the researchers had died, and I decided that I would try to get into the archive to see what they had to say about my dad. And Pierre Luigi was very supportive of that, and he took it much for further in uh, writing the book that he will talk to you about tonight. Uh, well, thank you. I'm going to tell the, the, the version, my version of the story, <laughs> which is uh, I actually, uh, but I had the pleasure of meeting Raymond. Uh, 2001, as we were celebrating Barney's Every Discover, and uh, I could really tell that he was the son of Richard Neutra. I mean, it was the same kind of a um, projection, family traits, uh, and the Austrian look. Uh, everything was there. And uh, we, it is really an honor to be a friend uh, of such an incredible legacy and to learn uh, directly uh, from you a lot of the uh, stories uh, about your dad, about the entourage. Uh, that he had and, uh, and everything that uh, he encountered over time. Uh, the story of the, the, this book is actually quite uh, uh, quite complicated in the sense that I, I had heard about the study from different people and uh, the, the thing that tipped uh, the experience uh, and changed the pace of this was actually meeting Raymond at the Oakland airport and he said, I found the files of my father and I think you should look at them. And, and, and therefore I realized what this archive was. But I, I knew that there had been a study of creativity because I, there were uh, certain uh, characters that had discussed this. Um, uh, some of them, Charles Eames, there was a, a recent book that came out with a collection of his writing. And uh, he said, one asked Philip Johnson what his solution had been. Philip answered, I use only black and white, what else? And he turned to Aero Saarinen and he said, Aero, what did you use? To which Aero replied, all white. Which referred to a mosaic uh, uh, exercise where they had to use 22 colors. They could use 22 colors. So, so uh, the story about this, uh, this mosaic, this anecdote, had been around for quite a long time. So that was Charles Eames. Then I actually, uh, here's Raymond, uh, who uh, told me about this. The person that told me that was in the committee selecting these architects was actually Don Olson. And I, I spent quite a bit of time with Don Olson, trying to understand the kind of climate that, there was, uh, that he had encountered in the 40s and in the Bay Area and what happened in the 50s. And uh, he was recruited by uh, William Worcester to uh, be one of the five members that were going to select the architects from UC Berkeley. Then Paul Goldberger had mentioned this uh, in, a, in a column in the New Yorker when he was writing there, uh, because Philip Johnson had told me that he was part of the creativity study uh, about the architects, and uh, nobody knew where these files were. And then, uh, last but not least, John Cleese mentioned this uh, in a, in a conference in, 19, in a lecture in 1989 that uh, some crazy people in Berkeley had decided to study creativity and they had come up with some ideas. So here I am, I get into this archive and I find all these files. But the files are not just uh, about architects, they are uh, just about, about creativity in general. And the study of the architects uh, took place uh, between 1958 and 1959 where groups of architects, uh, uh, where 40 architects in groups of 10, arrived for three-day weekends and submitted themselves to 22 hours of testing, which was really quite a, a feat, except that these were no ordinary architects. These were Louis Kahn, uh, Richard Neutra, Hiro Sarin, and 
uh, George Nelson, these are the people that created the mythology of the mid-century modern. So why would they come all the way to Berkeley to start doodling with sketches uh, for 22 hours? And it's quite a, a mystery to me. And the only person that I was able to, to um, interview of the architects that were still alive was actually Victor Bundy, who is a, an extraordinary architect. Uh, uh, he was 93 when I spoke with him, uh, extremely lively, he used to live in Houston. And he was 36 at the time, and he told me the story uh, of how he got involved into this. And the other person is still alive is uh, uh, Ian Pei. But I heard uh, directly from Warren Callister that he had been part of the study, and I heard from Mario Ciampi right before he died that he had been part of the study, except that I didn't have the book in mind, I was just learning about it. The other person that really gave me uh, uh, an overview of what this material was about was the only surviving researcher of this group, and her name is Ravenna Elson, and she is uh, at this point 81, extremely gracious, extremely knowledgeable. Um, she never really uh, was able to get to the, the top level of uh, the Institute of Personality Assessment Research uh, as part of the prize of an era which was very male driven. Uh, and I heard that they were going to write a book on this, but this book never came out. And I asked Ravenda, Ravenda, what happened? Why was the book, uh, why the book never came out? And she said, there was too much testosterone in that book. <laughs> 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 I don't think anybody agree on anything. So, so you see the personal assessment research is uh, the current uh, uh, the Department of Legal Studies. It's, uh, it's uh, a little off uh, on Piedmont Avenue, uh, very close to the International House. So you have to imagine that uh, these uh, top-notch architects were going into this kind of a um, odd building that had nothing to do with modernism, uh, but you know it was something that they were supposed to be judged by and understood by these researchers that were in these buildings. So there was a lot of commentary on that as well. And the people that made this experiment were uh, Don McKinnon, and uh, Don McKinnon was the um, was a chief scientist. Uh, of this team, but was also the chief of the uh, what was called the Session S uh, for the Office of Strategic Services in Washington, where the uh, Americans had realized initially that the Nazis uh, had devised these uh, uh, testing methods to pre-select uh, individuals that were going to go to very delicate missions, uh, and they were uh, going to be dispatched for for some war um, ends. And then the, the Brits learn about this lesson, they set up their own unit, and someone in London from Washington saw that, and in a month, literally, they set up a, a, a similar operation in, uh, um, in Virginia. And uh, Don McKinnon was at the head of this uh, uh, study, and for three years. And then Walt Hall was his right-hand man, was a PhD candidate at the time. And I was able to speak with Wallace Hall over the phone, and I know that Raymond actually met him. And uh, I, uh, I found that someone took a video when you were talking to, to the Wallace because, uh, yes, uh, I wanted to show you. I have it at my house. So, uh, in this initial group uh, of IHAR, Institute of Personality Assessment Research, the founder was Eric Erickson, one of the founders. So, it's, it's, uh, this is not new agey, tree hugging kind of thing. It was a, it was a, it was a genuine effort to study creativity, to understand that first to believe that creativity could be studied under a scientific method, and then to uh, to assemble a, a number of psychoanalytic traditions, of which uh, some come from Freud, uh, but also some came from Jung, uh, especially uh, Don McKinnon. Uh, I met personally uh, Jung and. and, and Another uh, psychoanalyst said Walter Rank. So they were trying to bring together these very strong uh, figures in a study that was very uh, specific. All they all they studied was creativity pretty much for the rest of their lives. I hear an echo in here. Should we put this a little lower? You know? Do you hear an echo? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So then, I, what I did, since I'm not a, I'm an architect, I'm not a psychologist. I tried to see uh, who was talking about uh, creativity. Then a bunch of people were talking about. It. 
So Maslow is the kind of creativeness that any healthy child has, and which is then lost by most people as they grow up. So there's a consensus that, that as you enter the world, that you come with this curiosity that is uh, un, uh, uncompromised. And, uh, and in a way, you will end up that the, the creative people will hold on to aspects of, of, of the initial experience. And they will not accept the status quo as it is, but they will still uh, retain that curiosity, that uh, endless question. And it will come up uh, not just in the study of the um, uh, creative architects, but also of other creative individuals. And we'll see who those are. Uh, Donald Winnicott was a child psychologist. It's the creative a perception more than anything else that makes the individual feel that life is worth living. Many individuals recognize for, that for, the most, for most of their time, they're living uncreatively, as if caught up in the creativity of someone else. So creativity has an existential dimension. You're expressing yourself. You're not leaving uh, someone else's agenda. Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, the impulse to make something new or to do something in a new way, a kind of divine discontent. All that has gone before, however good, then we can find such artists at every level of human culture, even when performing acts of great simplicity. So uh, the, one of the great uh, intuitions about this is it's not about being Michelangelo or making some major artistic statement, but it's just rethinking the status quo, having some kind of uh, um, reaction to uh, a perceived situation that brings a, a, a resolution to change that. And we'll see that that is a, a major driving force in the creative individual. Um, do creative people have difficult times? There, there, there was a, a lot of literature at the time that was uh, uh, showing the creative as someone that was uh, uh, possibly a deranged person, a, a displaced person, someone that had some kind of a psychological uh, problems, and, and, and creativity was just one outlet of, of what it was fundamentally a, a neurotic problem or some kind of mental problem. Uh, we decided to study individuals of outstanding creative ability and achievement in four different fields, architectural, literature, mathematics, and physical science. I had a, an exchange with Harrison Goff, who only would communicate. He was actually living around here, uh, in, uh, in, I think in Pacific Grove, and he would communicate with me through faxes, which was a problem to, to this day. So, but I have a bunch of faxes from him that tells the story of, uh, of the IPAR. So uh, he was one of the founders, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, we know that at some point in 1955, um, this shift from uh, uh, effectiveness to creativity took place. There was a, quite a bit of funding. Uh, some of the people that were in uh, part of the OSS had entered either the academia or institutional uh, foundations uh, and governmental agencies. Uh, so in a way, it was the same group that had dispersed itself, uh, but they were still connected. And so uh, they were told that uh, there was interest in, uh, in creativity and funding was going to be available. So they identified, they set up a, a proposal that was written uh, to a large extent by a fellow called Frank Barron, who uh, took uh, on himself the study of the, um, of the writers. And we'll see uh, uh, some of the writers that were part of this. But they identified four areas of interest uh, for the study. The, the, the creative uh, phenomenon was the result of four components. The creative person, the creative process, the creative situation, and the creative product. <laughs> so it's not just a creative person in the absence of all the other three elements could necessarily uh, succeed. So the creative person has brain capacity to retain, record, and recall from life history. So a lot of the effort was uh, put into understanding what happened early in their lives. And in this respect, uh, these files contain very, very, very personal information. So I'm, I'm actually really grateful that you trusted me that I was going to handle the material with care. Uh, because I learned a story of a lot of people that I should not know anything about. <laughs> and obviously, they didn't make part of the book, but I, I, met, I saw the files of Eero Saarinen. And then the last year, I met Eric Saarinen for the first time. And you know, with embarrassment, I mentioned to him aspects that I thought it was important that he should know about. And he seemed to be very gracious about it. But like this, many other, uh, many other uh, architects. Uh, Philip Johnson was just, uh, you know, that, that's a book by itself. 
the creative person uh, as a relative of the absence of repression and suppression as a mechanism for control of impulse. The creative process, the creative act is most often a protracted affair. So the eureka moment that is not quite the way it is. I mean, there's a level of turbulence uh, and, and, uh, and a time factor that plays out in it. Insight and inspiration come after prolonged searching. The ontogeny of an idea or otherwise creative product is characterized by lawfulness, and that is a subject to experimental uh, and observation study. So the idea that you can actually study creativity is something that had never been heard of before. It, it was not, not a subject of study. It's a, it really, with IPAR, this changed dramatically. There were signals in the 30s that things were happening in that respect, but to have a sample of over 1,500 people that would subject to themselves to all these uh, testing it is quite an extraordinary thing. It has never been repeated after that. The creative situation, creativity is not a fixed trait of personality, but it's something that changes over time, waxing and waning, being facilitated by some life circumstances and situations and inhibited by others. Not everybody is on top performance at all the times. There are moments where people can perform at a, a great level and other moments, the same person that did so well at a certain time is not doing as well at, at a later time. And, and they found this law pretty much in all the people that they work with. The study of the role of educational experience in nurturing creativity. It turns out that uh, uh, while these uh, uh, architects uh, were uh, you know, a solid B minus uh, at school in terms of their, their performance, uh, they, they have always had some kind of figure that changed uh, their the expectation of themselves. Uh, uh, possibly uh, a teacher, uh, an older colleague, a peer, someone that uh, sort of shocked them up from their unwillingness to commit. And then once they, they found their vocation, they are absolutely relentless on it. And that is across the board. And you know, if it's easier to see this in architects because they have a, a, a kind of a public figure, when you see this in a mathematician or in a chemist, well, then you realize that it has nothing to do with the media. It's, it's, a, it's a personality uh, structure. The creative product it involves a response that is novel or at least statistically infrequent. The response must be adapted to reality. It must serve to solve a problem, fit a situation, or accomplish some realistic, recognizable goal. It cannot be a fantasy goal. It has to be, I mean, we're going to solve the problem of the traffic in Los Angeles in ways that have never been solved before. But we're not doing something that nobody really cares for. True creation involves a sustaining of the original insight, an evaluation and elaboration of it, and a developing of it to the full. Uh, that's something that requires a lot of countercultural thinking because the normative thinking is always to do things in a certain way and the creative ruffle the feathers of that field. So there's a, there's a significant amount of rejection that takes uh, 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 quite a lot of time and result to overcome. Uh, that's something that uh, has been seen all across the board. So they use the assessment method. and. It was a method of psychological research developed to identify those who would perform effectively overseas in irregular warfare as spies, counter espionage agents, leaders of resistance groups behind enemy lines, and the like. So it was part of the war effort. It was a, a very specific goal, but the same method was used to study the creative individuals. And so they set up uh, these scenes. Actually, these are not the, the, the any of the creative folks, they were seeking funding, so they were simulating who, what they were going to do. It all looks very scientific and dependable. And here we have the writers that they uh, invited and, and that came. And we have among them Truman Capote, and there was Williams Carlos Williams, and there was Max Schulman. And, and there, you know, some uh, more famous than others, but they came. And they were extremely offended that scientists wanted to study them, but they came nonetheless. So the, 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 it's not just they coming, but it's the preparation of the experiment and the, com the convincing of them to come that was quite uh, uh, illuminating. It's certainly for me, if studying the architects. So they used to come, uh, and there was a big guest book and uh, here is uh, the signature of Truman Capote. I, I used to be very fond of uh, handwriting analysis. I don't do this anymore, but you realize what an introverted Capote is. 
And when I saw the, the, the signature of Sarin, and it, the S took four lines. <laughs> I mean, it was like a whole other world. And you can see Jack Warnicke, I mean, just all over the page. Another, like Harvard Huntington Harris, really small handwriting. So quite an interesting thing. So samples and criteria, we should uh, need an experimental sample of clearly original and creative persons and a controlled sample of individuals undistinguished in respect of creativity, ma matched in so far as possible with the experimental sample on the rel more relevant dimensions of age, sex, socioeconomic background, and intelligence. So they were not going to study just the top, but also those that were in the middle range. The problem is, how are you going to invite people who are in the middle range without offending them? So what you do is you just send a letter saying, we're doing a study on creativity. Would you like to participate? Which is very complimentary. But they, many people were selected because they were below a, a level of uh, excellence. Whereas uh, those that were uh, at the top notch were, uh, had been vetted through a process of uh, selection, which was quite substantial, it, it, it quite uh, prolonged. The subjects should not nominate themselves. I cannot say I'm the best architect in the world. It doesn't quite work like that. So someone has to tell you. So obviously, the people that were in the committee could not nominate themselves uh, in whatever field. Um, nor be selected by the staff of the institute. They should be chosen by some person or group external to the study. So in fairness, they, they, they reached out to uh, individuals outside, except that individuals uh, outside have their own opinions and their biases. So in, because the group uh, of architects, uh, the, the selected the architects, were headed by Worcester, William Worcester, who was the dean at UC Berkeley, from 1950 to 1963, Worcester had a, a very strong point of view. He thought that Alvar Aalto was the best architect in the world, and that means it was a disaster. So you will realize that there's a particular kind of strand of architecture that will be, uh, that will be um, um, supported, and others that will not. So, but regardless, whichever group you take, someone is going to have opinions. And so he recruited all the people that were supportive of him, of his um, uh, point of view. So Worcester was then McKinnon called Worcester. I need help. Can you, can you help me set the team? And Worcester uh, brought four people with him: Don Olson, Vernon Demar, Joe Escherich, and a young fellow called Philip Thiel, who was a, a faculty that ended up in uh, uh, Seattle, was more of a naval architect. And uh, there's a, a sixth uh, person that uh, uh, is the unofficial participant of this group, who was uh, someone who had tremendous uh, uh, influence in post-war architecture in Northern California, I would say on the West Coast in general. And that's uh, uh, Elizabeth Kendall Thompson, called Betty Thompson. Um, she advised uh, uh, McKinnon more than Worcester on how to deal with the architects, who to invite. Uh, and uh, um, I found her archive. Uh, the archive is in the hands of her daughter. She showed up at a lecture. She said, I am the daughter of Betty Thompson. I said, immediately, where's the archive? And so I found everything. I found the whole uh, um, correspondence with the creative architects and all sorts of other things. So a, a really important figure. And she wrote the definition of creativity in architecture. So, which was handed to the architects, uh, to, to the, it was handed to the professors uh, that were going to then select the architects. So, originality of thinking, freshness of approaches to architectural problems, constructive ingenuity, ability to set aside established conventions and procedures when appropriate, a flair for devising effective and original fulfillments of the major demands of architecture, technology, visual form, planning, and human awareness and social purpose. So. Um, as declarative as you can be, not necessarily AIA material, uh, but uh, um, it, it gives parameters. So how many people actually fit these four categories, technology, visual for planning, and human awareness and social purpose. So they start uh, um, giving scores to these architects, and I found all the scores. So it, it wasn't just the 40 architects they selected, all the others that didn't, didn't show up. Obviously, they were doing this separately without talking to each other. So at Stone, in the hands of uh, um, Worcester, this is Worcester, www, 
and Gordon Barschaft. So Worcester about uh, the Rolston, mainly interested in appearance. Obviously, it, Worcester would not tell this stone on his face, but that's what he thought. <laughs> but that's the beauty of the study, because <laughs> nobody was going to ever see this material. Gordon Barschaft, the designer of Skidmore Owens and Merrily, an extreme metal and glass boy. Uh, Pietro Belluschi, uh, excelling in the light, a leader fresh. Pietro Belluschi is one of the great architects that we don't really talk, uh, hear much uh, about, but he had hands in a lot of different projects uh, throughout the United States. Um, uh, Bernard Demar uh, on Belluschi, uh, all five. You have to think that these, uh, all the five uh, members of the selection committee were doing this separately. So then they were putting together all the, uh, tallying all these results, and you see that there is a more or less convergence on, uh, on uh, um, the evaluations. Uh, Beluski, again, for Joe Estrick. Uh, this is Don Olsen. Neutra, uh, for here, for you. Uh, you've seen this, but as intellect. So that's good. <laughs> he, per he performed. Worcester liked it. So um, the, for uh, Bernard Demar, uh, top uh, scores, one of the most uh, prolific designers, builders, artists, writer, involved in every sort of project, large and small. His body of work, 20 and 30, pushed to the use of steel, blah, blah, blah. So it's quite complementary. Uh, Bernard Demar will get into elaborate uh, explanations of why certain people are important. Uh, Joe Estrick, um, 555, an early and vociferous modernist propagandist that continues to be a propagandist and writer, but at the same time continues to do better and better work. So uh, uh, kind of uh, unsuspected by Joe Estrick, uh, if you think about it. And again, uh, Don Olson, considered one of the great international famous architects, well known for his attainment in all aspects of his work, consistent, consistent, interesting planning, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of fun reading all these evaluations. Uh, I cannot tell you what was said about Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I might have it actually here. I'll see. But here the invitations were sent. At the time, Alvar Alto was thought to be at the, in the United States uh, for the MIT uh, dorms. So these are all the people that they tried to invite Breuer, Kant, Saarinen, uh, uh, Henry Wies, and Ilfor, Victor Gruen, Rapson, Stubbins, uh, um, Jose Luis Sert. Uh, Philip Johnson, Frank Lloyd Wright, Louis Smith Mandero, and I know Charles Eames and stuff like that. So uh, in the first group that got nominated by all five, uh, all five architects, uh, Belluschi, Breuer, Daly, Gropius, Johnson, Kahn, Miss Vandero, Neutra, Rapson, Saren, and Stubbins, and Frank Lloyd Wright. So uh, not, uh, not bad. These are some of the letters of acceptance by Belluschi. Uh, I find it very difficult to justify my absence during this time, but I'm intrigued by your project, so I'm coming. Hugh Stubbins, I regret very much that I have to renege renege on the day which I made for the study. Uh, Yamasaki, excuse my long delay in replying. Some people were trying to come, but they couldn't in the end. So these are um, Jose Luis Sert. Unfortunately, we don't have the time nor the necessary personnel to take care of such matters here. So quite curt <laughs> at Harvard. So these are uh, the, the people from the, the panels of editors that they try to involve. Uh, Peter Blake, uh, Douglas Saskel, Walter McQuaid, uh, Thomas Craydon, uh, Elizabeth Kendall Thompson. So it was primarily forum, architecture forum, architecture record, journal of the OVA, and progressive architecture. So they all gave uh, a, a, a chart. So everything was tallied, and so they, they realized who was the very first one. Confidential, not to be shown to anybody. Frank Lloyd Wright was the first, Mies was the second, Eero Sarinen was the, was the third. So these were the people that came versus the people that didn't come. Belluschi, uh, Walter uh, Gropis, Yamasaki, Breuer, Rudolf, uh, Neutra, Johnson. Johnson, who was one of the most controversial characters in the history of architecture really was up there in those days. I mean, he had uh, incredible clout. And so you put them together. This is Frank Lloyd Wright and everything else. There's quite a, a range of characters. 
Um, these are the architects that were part of the Bay Area. Uh, Bob Ashton, Ernst Bohr, Mario Ciampi, Gardner Daly. Obviously, there's a heavy Bay Area uh, influence. Uh, had this study been done in New York, we would see a lot of New York architects because it's just harder to convince people to come all the way through. Uh, so Jack Warren, Nicky Wally Wong. And so there were some, this tier of characters, Sarinen, Neutra, Johnson, Khan, I am Pei. Uh, these are some, uh, I, I found these, these images uh, uh, about uh, a gondola party, and I always thought it was really fun to, to show them. But uh, your Sarinen probably was the biggest fish that they caught at the time, because Khan had not done the work, uh, he had done some of the work, but not all the work compared to Arrow. And when Arrow accepted in April, then Johnson accepted right after him. Like it, because the whole point was people wanted to spend time with Eero Saarinen. Uh, w where they were going to spend three days with someone this big. And so everybody tried. That was the first thing that Landy said. You know, uh, that, um, so this is the gondola party? Um, actually, you know, what, I was saying, what I wanted to say is that, I know it sounds silly, but someone told me you know, that they have flooded a basement and put a gondola on it. And I didn't believe until I saw it. And that, so he's uh, there, so it's, it happened. So the assessment schedule, uh, this is uh, uh, what they were going to go through. It started at 2 p.m. on Friday, back to back, uh, cocktail dinners, uh, who does what, when and how. So no time for, th this is something that McKinnon said, this is not gonna be a relaxing weekend. You know, you're not coming to the Bay Area to lounge. And so this is, and they were exhausted by, by three o'clock on Sunday, it was farewell. And um, there were a number of uh, uh, procedures that they went through, most of them text-based, but there were a bunch of, uh, uh, the only graphic one was really uh, these mosaics, which I found all of them except one. And these were the mosaics that early on, I was telling you, uh, Philip Johnson picked uh, two colors and Erosarian, all white. So these are some of, uh, uh, of them. And these are just vignettes of uh, uh, them having group discussions. And uh, I'm gonna play for you the ethics problem. And it's gonna be between these five characters, Sher Shermayev, George Nelson, Harry Wees, Arwell Harris, and John Funk. I'm gonna play two uh, pieces. Uh, I found these recordings uh, where the architects are discussing a problem which uh, the researcher is gonna tell you in a moment. And then uh, you, you, kind of, you can feel the energy between them, and which is quite uh, interesting. And there's also a certain attitude that several characters have. This is the researcher telling the story of what the, the problem is going to be. I don't think that will pick it up, do you? <laughs> Lots of drinks, martinis. They were serving martinis. For the next 30 minutes, we would like to hear your views about a problem and also hypothetical. Embodying some issues important for architects as well as those in the other field. I'll read the problem to you and ask you to first indicate your personal reaction on the social paper. Then I'll ask you to address the issue candidly on yourself and reach a joint conclusion at the end of the 30 minute period. Here is the problem Mr. Brown is faced with a difficult decision. He has just finished a preliminary drawing for a very challenging and important structure. His client has told him that he likes Mr. Brown's proposal very much and will accept it if he will change one fairly important aspect of the design. The client would like it altered in a specific way. Brown has tried as hard as he can to persuade his client from his point of view, but to no avail. His client still feels strongly about it, but tells Brown that while he's very pleased with his design, he will have to reject it if the change is not made. Brown's sense of architectural quality greatly disturbed by the client's demands. Most of what he feels about visual form, design, function, and beauty would be violated if the design were changed. On the other hand, the commission is highly prized since it is to be an interesting, challenging, and a prominent structure. He feels that in addition to being an architect, he is in business and has a fair obligation to please his client. Since 
Humans, after all, who find this pain for the structure, and he'll have to live with it. <coughs> and as a practical matter, he has the responsibility to support himself and those who depend upon him. As he's weighing these factors, the phone rings and the client asks for his answer. If you were Brown, what would you do? And I, so what would you do? Imagine that these five folks have to come to a joint decision. <coughs> and these are people that are fundamentally very uh, independent individuals. So I'm going to play an exchange between uh, uh, Sir Shermayev and George Nelson. In two Again. I'm, going to sh I'm going to play two uh, sections on this, one by uh, both an exchange with, uh, between Sir Shermayev and George Nelson have the most uh, kind of a, a colorful way of expressing themselves. By recommending the flexible out here. Recommended mm. uh, <laughs> to, to start up, to change other. Okay. I said I wasn't certain, but I'm not. Yeah. This is John Funk and it's on the table. Oh, wow. And this yeah. is a shirt. I was very good with that. You said no. Yeah, and I would say no, but I would say no probably not by recommending the flexible out here. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and, and actually, <laughs> put that down. Yeah. Oh, okay. See, I, I really think the, the DCS here is a very interesting one. Uh, don't, don't you think? Um, the fact really is, who do you think you are? You see, and I think I'm the kind of architect people come to because I'm going to give them what I do and not what they want. Uh, if you are, on the other hand, in business, that's another thing. You see, I just want to make business. Uh, this is simply a thing. You are a university payroll. It was bad. That is George Nelson. That's why I give up. That's why I was constantly faced with this kind of silly problem. Life's too short. So, one more George Nelson, which I think was probably given up. And the reason for the problem really was that the, the, uh, the problem as stated was a kind of probably too, because you don't really know from the statement of the problem uh, how seriously this one item would affect the whole thing. You get the impression that uh, Brown's client is a rather arbitrary and unreasonable guy, but you know you're not quite sure uh, in a real life situation by which I mean you have more data. You would know whether this one requirement was reasonable or not. But the general impression I had was that the client was being a damn nuisance. Yes, I'm not the reason. And you probably would do well to get rid of it. Oh, this is what I feel. But only probably because you don't know exactly what he is up to. Okay, so the client is a damn nuisance. <laughs> you better get rid of him. So let's see what happens a little after that. Okay, I'm start that point. I the original covenant of the specifications of drawings and charges for this. The architect somehow the got his soft in their desperate battle to survive. <laughs> so they are prepared to just redraw the thing from heaven to the to moon. Um, um, I think this is one of the weaknesses of the profession, actually. And I, I think the profession uh, should be much tighter and say, in, in a case where a completely whimsical sort of change at the 11th hour, which is implied in this question, if it were so, I don't think it happens often, but if it did happen, I would expect to be paid for my work. In other words, I would want a fee for the variation so whimsically produced. But we don't do this. So we really think professionally we are somehow uh, the slaves of the wind plants. I think it's really, I think it's unprofessional in the most serious sense of the world. Well, I didn't get the impression from the problem as read that the client was being whimsical. I gathered that of all the elements in the program he presented, Everything had been satisfied except one thing. I mean, that this was not an eleventh hour. But it, I addition. think the indication, as earlier stated, is it must have been eleventh hour because you know, in the normal process, which you yourself described, you see this kind of uh, real <coughs> annoyance to the client must have been ironed out, so to speak, in conversation in the preliminaries. Well, How did it occur except at the eleventh hour? 
in the sense that the question was posed. And I think this is the weakness of the question, really. It doesn't happen in any way. Well, actually, it, it doesn't happen. There was a one part that was good. Right. Again, you, you regret that the, that the situation is in somewhat more detail. Yeah. And, um, well, you know, there's, a, there's an assumption at this end of the room that architects are just dandy. <laughs> And it's possible that there's some holes in this assumption. Yes, I'm going to speak to Okay, I'm going to play one more uh, uh, portion. Uh, this is uh, actually um, Bob Anshin uh, of Anshin and Allen telling the story of how the firm started. The seed of the firm was actually this conversation, which is incredibly rare because Bob Anshin died in 1964. So I was the one that recognized uh, Bob Ashton telling the story. So there's something really quite extraordinary about it. So please indulge me. There was a man in San Francisco who had just fired the eighth architect for the largest house to be built in the Bay Area. Bay Area. <laughs> since, uh, since the Depression, no. <clears throat> and uh, he had paid them all. He didn't like the drawings. And, uh, they were all prominent architects, and neither Steve or I had our dog tags in that time. And so we didn't know the man, but we knew his name, and he happened to be a vice president of Stanford Oak Company in California. He was a senior vice president. Kingsbury was still president. And so uh, I borrowed 50 bucks from my boss, and Steve borrowed 50 bucks from his. And we got a cashier's check, the Wells Fargo bank made out to this man. And we sent this, we had spent $10 of our own money with uh, some very thick, beautiful parchment stationery. And we decided to do this in my name, and if I got fired, well, Steve was going to support me if I had another job. <laughs> and so the letter went like this, there is something that interests me and may interest you, and since I have no idea what value to place on your time, I'm closing a cashier's check for $100 for a half an hour, yours very truly. And so, the secretary sent the check back and made an appointment. And I went over there. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, the telephone in Tant's office started to ring. He came up one day and he said, Bob, you must be opening an awful lot of charge accounts or something. The retail credit bureau is calling up banks, insurance companies, detective agencies. They want to know who you are and how much you make and where you come from. So I knew by the time I walked into this man's office that he knew probably more about me than I did myself, possibly not as much as you did, no. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I sat down at his desk and explained first that we weren't even architects because we didn't have a dog tag, and in California you have to announce to your client that you're not an architect if you're not. And so then I said, what kind of house do you want? And he said he thought that an English house would be nice. He said he'd... Uh, lived in England for some time, and he liked the quiet, informal character of the countryside, and that he thought the English house would be nice. So I said, well, it's your money, and no one can control what you do with it, except yourself. What kind of English house do you want? Do you want a Georgian English house, or a Gothic English house, or a Saxon English house, or a modern English house? And he allowed us though, to the Gothic would be nice. And so, I said, well, you can go over and buy a beautiful, authentic, magnificent thing. Take it all down, rearrange it here, approximately the way it was. You can buy it, you can pay for it, no one can say you may. But the only thing that you can't control is that once you've got it over here, it'll be nothing but a goddamn ache. And then getting my theoretical half hour's money's worth, I gave the man a lecture in truth and honesty and architecture with a water you know, just careening down my ears. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, told him that there were just some things that you can't control, that you can't buy, but if he wanted the spirit of an English house, if he wanted a quiet, informal, unpretentious, rambling, low house with no uh, derivative forms, but with the techniques and technologies and uh, workmanship of today, we might be able to satisfy him. So he said, well, I'll pay for the preliminary drawings if I like it. I don't know what I want. So we happened to like them, and that was our first job. So there are ways when people are intelligent and not <coughs> some ways, where even someone, hey, this particular man's wife wanted a French provincial house, and it was just glass and stone, and 
Red Blue, it's a very, very contemporary house. So I think these problems can be overcome. Uh, you're, you're a so it's a, it's a great story because I heard it heard from this, um, Steve Allen in a, in a old recording, and I heard it from you, Derek, and from a few others, from Dean Stone himself. So to hear it directly from Bob Marshall was quite an extraordinary thing. So I, I heard it especially for you, Derek. So they studied uh, writers, uh, mathematicians, uh, Stanford gifted studies, women studies, and there was uh, uh, a sort of an intelligence uh, uh, index, uh, an IQ, uh, it was called the concept, uh, concept mastery test. And the architects did okay to this one, in this one, compared to the writers. Uh, the Fire B uh, was a, a test that had been invented by some of the IPAR uh, scientists. This was uh, uh, Richard Neutra. Um, I, and, 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 you know, you give a, a check on uh, um, or, uh, or a number on, on certain adjectives. I try to have close relationship with people. Uh, sometimes I let other people strongly influence my actions. Often I try to have some close personal relationship with people. Usually I try to include other people in my plans. Usually I try to have people around me. Usually I try to get close and personal with people. Usually that's Neutra, Philip Johnson. I join social group, never. I tend to join social organization when I have an opportunity, never. I try to be included in informal social activities, never. I try to include other people in my plans, never. When people are doing things together, I tend to join them, never. I try to participate in group activity, never. So that's uh, Philip Johnson. Eero Saarinen, I try to be with people, usually. I join social groups. Uh, occasionally, I tend to join social organization when I have the opportunity, rarely. I let other people strongly influence me often. Um, I try to have people around me often. Uh, something that was really extraordinary about this data set is that uh, um, they asked uh, them uh, what was their contribution to modern architecture at, you know, in 1958, 59. So at least those things uh, which you have done, which you consider innovations in the field of architecture and design, and Khan said, the distinction into, in the planning of spaces between spaces which serve and the spaces served. Architecture is the thoughtful making of spaces, the integration of the mechanical and electrical services with the constructional to give form of the building. So this is Khan understanding himself, and you rarely uh, hear that. Euro Saarinen, I believe innovations is the wrong word, but I believe I have contributed much to the architectural and furniture design. Myself and my associates created the first curtain wall, which is obviously wrong, because the first curtain wall was done in, uh, um, th that is now is the Holiday Building by Willis Polk, but probably even earlier uh, in industrial structures that were the, the beginnings of these glass walls. But that's what he believed. Uh, first uh, neoprene gasketing uh, of architectural windows and first in many of new developments. Uh, in design and concept, the St. Louis Arch is, I believe, a contribution. General Motors Techno Technical Center is another. The MIT Chapel is, I believe, important. So those are the things that he believes are major. Beluski first all aluminum uh, and glass skin office building. Heated and air conditioned by a reverse cycle method. This is the equitable building in Portland, which is an extraordinary piece of architecture. And then uh, other you know, uh, interests that, that these characters had. The following subject had fathers who were inclined towards some forms of the art. Uh, uh, Robert Alexander, Warren Callister, uh, John Funk, uh, John, John Johansson, uh, Louis Kahn, Ernie Kamp, uh, Paul Schweiker, Bob Anshin, Howard Hamilton Harris, and Soriano and Belusky. Uh, the following subjects have mothers who were talented in the arts. Alexander, Callister, Daly, Johansson, Keck, Nelson, uh, Noyes, Pei, and so it's really interesting trying to figure out if, if the parents had any influence in the decisions of their children. Um, then then uh, th these guys uh, were interviewed and then the interviewer um, scored them. And uh, he, uh, uh, this fellow Welsh, thought that Philip Johnson was a solid four in maturity and responsibility, which is on the low side. 
and uh, six in originality, and three in personal stability and adjustment. Um, so he wrote, the subject seems like a controlled psychotic. He did have manic depressive episodes while in college and was out of school for three years. I had a nervous breakdown, went to a very nice psychiatrist, and I was manic depressive. Uh, um, from time to time, the subject referred to his homosexuality but gave no details uh, as to either of his early or current sexual activities. He showed manic, many classic features of the manic, self-centered, irritable, jumpy, flight of ideas, arrogance, use of humor to defend against serious consideration of anxiety-producing topics. So uh, you, uh, I then found a, a, a request to release these files uh, by uh, Franz Schultz, who was doing a uh, a biography on Philip Johnson, and uh, the iPart didn't release these files because there was all this material. This is like a lawsuit just waiting to happen. So you see this correspondence back and forth years later. We're not going to release these files. Um, and so Johnson said, "Do you personally place a high value in creativity, in creativeness, in architecture? It doesn't help to work too hard. Uh, what are the most important things for professional advancement in architecture? Is all luck." So what do you attribute your special success in architecture? A glass house in Connecticut is the reason for my success. How would you sum up your present life situation? Fine, I have no worries, no problem, everything is fine. I give most of my money to museums, uh, give scholarship from time to time, 500,000 or so, but I'm really stingy. This is 1959, so it's about $9 million of our uh, today's time. So Khan, I joined social group Never. I try to have close relationship with people, never. I tend to join social organizations, never. I try to be included in social activities, never. I try to have close personal relationships with people, never. And I let other people control my actions, never. So you realize that, that also the, the kind of office environment that, that Louis Kahn had to have in order to be able to do his work. Um, thank you very much for your letter. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, your staff, for a most enjoyable and interesting weekend. So the architects rank themselves. They, say, they give them files and uh, they ask them to say, you know, rank yourself between these 40 architects. Who is the first? So let's see, Louis Kahn said that the first was Richard Neutra. So, which was a surprise to me and I also believe to Raymond, honestly because he always thought about Le Corbusier. Uh, and then uh, uh, Khan put himself number two and Eero Saarinen number three. Eero Saarinen put himself number one, and then Philip Johnson number two, and Neutra number three, and Khan number four. So not bad. Uh, Elliot Noy is one of the hardest. To, to fill out. I.M. Pei is number one, two is Eero Saarinen, and number three is uh, Victor Lundy. Be uh, Victor Lundy, uh, he grouped them in between one to five. Eero Saarinen he included himself into this first group, and Philip Johnson was in the, in the second group. Then, uh, and these are just a sample. There were thousands and thousands of pages. I mean, my head was spinning. It was really difficult to, to come together with, with a book because it, it could never end. So uh, this is the subject uh, that described themselves. Uh, you know, they, they had to have all these objects uh, uh, available to describe themselves. And what did they pick? So he felt that it was uh, uh, capable, care, uh, careless, uh, Caution, uh, cautious, changeable, civilized, he was easygoing, he was masculine and mature, he was kind, uh, he was honest, uh, he was versatile and suggestible. So he gave a, a, um, an idea of who, who he was. And then uh, the ideal architect, uh, he, he felt there was, uh, so it, they, they were asked to rank them to, to identify themselves as a, the, the architect, but what would the ideal architect be? And they were sort of the, the top-notch architects. So they said that the, the ideal architect for him had to be uh, kind and inventive and intelligent and frank and uh, generous and gentle. I mean, all very flattering um, qualifiers. So uh, then they grouped together in the increasing order the adjective, in the adjective checklist that in the ideal, what all the architects had decided that the ideal architect should have. So it should be active, honest, idealistic, idealistic, inventive, artistic, civilized, conscientious, uh, 
intelligent, reasonable, adaptable, determined, fair-minded, independent, individualistic, progressive, appreciative, capable, cooperative, enthusiastic, friendly, healthy, industrious, interests, wide and serious, practically inhuman, as you know. And then the actually the, uh, the checklist of the real architect in a, a decreasing order of percentage. They were hurried, high strung, nervous, too moody and self-centered, too absent-minded and forgetful, less ingenious and resourceful, thoughtful and wise, less natural and relaxed, less forceful, daring and courageous, and less confident and calm. So a uh, disaster compared to speaking. But they were the top notch. So clearly, there's a disconnect between the ideal and the real. And so just in, in closing, uh, the, there, is, uh, there, there have been studies uh, on, uh, on uh, or at least uh, uh, some conclusions uh, that have been uh, made by uh, some important personalities. Uh, this one of uh, Henry Poincaré was drawn out of his diaries. To create consists of making new combinations of associative elements which are useful. The mathematical facts worth being studied are those which reveal to us unsuspected kinships between other facts well known, but wrongly believed to be strangers to one another. So there's the idea that creativity is really the rewiring of certain patterns, species of knowledge. So if, you, if things are done in a certain way, the same pieces can be organized in a different way, and they will yield a different result. So you're not inventing everything from ground up. So they did a book on creativity. There was a, at least the IPAR stuff I had in, in mind to do this book. And I have aspects of the manuscript. But the book wasn't that interesting, I have to say. No, uh, it was very pedantic, uh, although the material was so rich. Experts say IQ is overrated. They realized that IQ was not really the determinant of, uh, of creativity. Uh, past a certain level of performance, uh, being more intelligent doesn't mean that you're more creative. So the creative process uh, has five parts. They confirmed that. Preparation, concentrated effort, incubation, insight, and verification. So you go through this uh, period of search. Uh, you really focus. You typically get frustrated. You don't get the answer that you want. You do something else, you garden, you water the plants, whatever. You have an insight, uh, you verify the insight, and then the project is done. Problem setting was just as important as problem solving. Simply stated, questions might appear intractable if they are incorrectly stated. The truly creative person knows who he is, where he, where he wants to go, and what he wants to achieve. The creative person has solved the problem of his own identity, which is one of the cornerstones of uh, Eric Erickson's work, the problem of identity. Sense of their own destiny that includes a, a degree of resoluteness and almost inevitably a measure of egotism. They feel that they are kind of predestined. They're, they're chosen to do what they need to do. Without some kind of psychiatric turbulence, a healthy form of restlessness combined with an independence of spirit, what is not likely to grow creatively. These were sort of a, uh, conclusions that McKinnon had arrived in the hope of creating some kind of educational environment where some of these principles could be adapted. But it, it was virtually impossible. Uh, creative individuals are often quite conventional in manners and in action that are not central to, the areas, uh, to their areas of work. So uh, architects can be absolutely ordinary in many other areas, but in their area, uh, they are uh, um, mavericks or they're true originals. And I, through my own experience, I've seen this uh, um, with a number of architects so whose work I greatly admire. The truly creative person tends to be a nonconformist and is profoundly independent in judgment, thought, and action. The creative person has an unusual capacity to record and retain and has readily available to him the experience of his life history. Um, obviously, this is a study done largely with men, uh, but uh, they did stu the study of the writers are two women. Then they did study on uh, uh, women mathematicians uh, and women writers. So there were other follow-up studies uh, on, on children writers. There was the, the writer of Mary Poppins that came as well, uh, but it wasn't recorded. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't see the data set. Finding the solution to a problem is not sufficient to bring them personal satisfaction. There is the further demand that the solution be elegant. So the, the, the elegance of the solution is just as important as the solution. Uh, it cannot be, which is a kind of the, the uh, 
it, it kills once and for all the idea that problem solving is the solution of architecture, which is a standard thing that you hear in the literature of post-war work. It, that's not true. You can solve the problem in many different ways that are actually quite uneventful. But the, the, the creative person wants an elegant solution. There's a formal uh, demand. The more creative a person is, the more he reveals an openness to his own feelings and emotions. So, so Ravenna told me that, uh, Ravenna Helson, this, uh, the researcher told me that the creative individuals had a, a very high, what was called femininity index. And they said, can you explain to me what femininity index means? He said, I, uh, that they, the, these subjects uh, uh, had a very strong connection with their, with their emotions. Uh, so even people that ordinarily would look uh, uh, sort of much colder or, or, or not showing that, the tests show that in fact they were. The creative person's upper perceptive, perceptive attitude expresses itself in curiosity, often in childlike form. There's this endless curiosity uh, at any age, which is really quite remarkable. Almost 50% of the architects were solitary children. The creative architect revealed even less desire to be included in group activities than that expressed by the naval and civilian personnel who volunteered to man the Ellsworth Station outpost in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives, so that, let's talk about collaboration, right? That's a problem, obviously. The more creative architects are less interested in small details and are more concerned with meanings and implications. Uh, the very personality of, uh, pot of the potentially creative student is almost ideally well suited to self-instruction. We will not create our able student in the image of the highly creative if we, well, we always insist upon their being well-rounded. So that, in a way, is a, a case for the independent study uh, the, uh, that he ultimately says is the perfect uh, environment for the individual to grow his or her own talent. And so these are the, some of the uh, graphic, uh, um, the graphs uh, that put together uh, some of the Meyer Briggs indicators. Uh, judgment uh, for group, group one is uh, uh, the, the architects one is the, the, is the top notch. Group two are the architects that work for two years with, group, with architects of group one, but never achieved the same level of uh, renown. And group three were people that were taken from a director of the AIA for 1955. So judgment was a big uh, uh, element in uh, uh, group three, whereas it was less pronounced in group one. Perception was much more pronounced in group one than in group three. Sensation was uh, much more pronounced uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, group three than in uh, sensation, meaning that if I don't see it, it doesn't exist. And which is, you know, uh, they divided bankers, uh, 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 postal workers, uh, morticians, uh, uh, police officers, are all, all work on sense, uh, whereas uh, uh, architects uh, largely work on intuition. And you can see uh, the most creative architects do that. And uh, in this graph, uh, architect one is the solid line. They give a very high uh, importance to the aesthetic and the lowest to the economic. And they all converge to the social and the political in some form, which is quite revealing. Parents of the creative people, a curious and inquiring mind, an ability to see problems uh, where others don't, the capacity for awe and a sense of wonder, a uh, perceptive uh, rather than judgmental attitude, a preference for experience outside conventional categories, a fertile imagination, a capacity for emotional encounter with the environment, a zestful and self-confident commitment to life, a high level of psychic energy, a flexibility of mind and person, a high level of effective intelligence, a tolerance for ambiguity, we drive for clarity and precision, the courage to be oneself, apart from the collectivity, a preference for the complex, asymmetrical, and incomplete, a capacity for intuition, and a strong drive to be complete. So these are the traits that they found, not just in the architects, but in all the creative people. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. We went a little over. Well, you're all here. I'm delighted. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions. There's no such thing as creative thinking. There's only thinking. That's true. That's true. And the use of the word creative as an adjective for the thinking simply clouds up the, the theory of creativity.
uh, but there's one element that, that, that uh, the creative person has, which is the courage to go outside of the uh, standardized way of doing things. Because the standardized ways of doing things uh, is clearly the preferred one. In uh, especially, especially in risk adverse environments, let me as architects, as I'm sure you have I've seen many times, and many of you who practice, uh, the client <coughs> is very risk adverse unless there's a client that is uh, willing to go with you. But the norm, I would say, 95 percent, if not higher, is risk adverse. So you are forced to stay with standardized solution. Uh, except that with the standard resolution, you don't advance the field in any field. So there is a moment where you have to step out of that comfort zone and deal with the uh, unknown. And uh, you cannot know the solution before you try it. So there, uh, there's an element of entropy that the creative person uh, lives with uh, in a healthy way. Uh, he or she is not um, displaced emotionally, psychologically by this discomfort. And the creative person can harness that energy to do the work that he or she wants to do. That's something that has been seen pretty much throughout. So that's why there's so much of, um, resolve in the intuition. Um, there, there is the belief, uh, which, no, these are people that have proven themselves. These are not just megalomaniacs. Like, they might be megalomaniacs as well, but, but they were at the top of their game when they were being involved. So they have proven themselves, which is hard when, uh, when there is uh, someone who has not uh, shown uh, their talent to realize. They have promise, but the promise doesn't, doesn't result into the product. And uh, uh, to me, the value of this is understanding that creativity is uh, the synergy between these four components, the creative person, the creative process, the creative product, and the creative environment. And in the absence of these three, you can, I mean, the creative people are everywhere in the world, right? But there are some areas that seem to be more creative than others, because these four elements uh, seem to be uh, more in sync with each other, and there's diversity of that expression. I've always found a very important skill for an architect to be able to draw and that wasn't mentioned at all in the interviews that you talked about. And the ability to be able to take a thought, an abstract thought, and communicate that in a simple diagram to a client is a very important skill. And I think, um, I think in my later years, most of my time was spent educating a client to get them ready for the solution when, when it came. And there's nothing more terrifying than a blank piece of paper. You sit and look at it and you don't say, I'm going to be creative today. You know, you go on a journey, it's a very complex, time-consuming journey of discovery. And I always start with the site. You know, the site tells you a lot. There's topography, trees, vegetation, the sun comes up this way, the winds are this way. And the discovery tends to produce creative solutions, particularly when you come to the site from different directions. And then to be able to communicate that simply with drawings to a client is a very powerful skill that architects have. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, what you just said. Uh, it's actually the criticism that Sarian and Landy have when they filled out the, the uh, the, I can't remember, post question or something like that. They, 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 came, they went back home and then they were supposed to uh, fill out some uh, paperwork uh, about their experience. And they said, this, this seems to be procedures devised by uh, people that deal with primarily with words, but we artists deal with images. So I, we didn't see much of an opportunity to express ourselves in drawings. So that was true. But the other aspect is that uh, uh, they, I part nailed the, the issue that creativity involves a real problem. And, and for architects, a real problem is the site, is the, the program, is the budget, is a real thing. And so to be able to cook a solution that is outside of the standard uh, and having the courage to propose, to come up with that, to think about it, and then to do it, 
um, that re requires uh, first that you have to solve the problem of your identity, that you believe that you are capable of doing something like this. Second is that, that, that you're going to be able to, to counteract the resistance of the client. It's not that you enter into a battle, but you have to do a lot of convincing. So uh, what I heard, because I've met many people that work in the Sarian's office, uh, they said that he was very persuasive. And someone uh, once said uh, uh, that the client was very upset because he was talking, he was not uh, finishing up his thoughts uh, in the time that they had. And he said, well, I'm just going to say half of what I have to say, but I'm not going to change the pace of, the, of what I say. And, and this kind of a gravitas, this authority, I mean, he was barely 51 when he died, allowed him to deal with clients uh, that were you know, really uh, themselves at the top of their game. So that's something that, uh, uh, for in the, in the case of Saren, his life history was he was born the same day as his father, Elio. He was dyslexic. His father was remote. Uh, he wanted to, to be loved by his father. And then I, I read from his, his interview, he said, I, my father not being an architect, I would have not been an architect. Well, that's extraordinary. So the project, the whole project of Saren in architecture is to find the love of his father. So if the father had been a, a, a watchmaker, he would have been a watchmaker. Whereas I don't think that Khan would have been anything else but an architect, and, or, or Frank Lloyd Wright. So uh, th there are singularities that, that reveal the, 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 the energy that people put into that. I mean, there was a, like, even in Bob Ashton, there was some craziness going on in the personality. It was so brilliant, and, 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 but jumpy too. We're a very individualistic society, so the whole focus of this thing, although they did talk about the um, creative situation, it was sort of, what is the situation that this great individual can shine in, as opposed to this situation that you described, where two people are in symbiosis, or where somebody is like a, a brilliant symphony conductor or a brilliant basketball coach that has the capability of creating an organization that is uh, a happy and productive organization. And did they touch on that at all? I know that my dad's comment was that he thought one of his talents was working together with different people. But that's a little bit different, that's a little bit individualistic again, rather than saying, you know, I have the capacity of creating an environment that, that people blossom together and that the chemistry happens. Um, well, McKinnon uh, gave a talk uh, at the um, uh, ACSA, which is the Association of uh, College of uh, Schools of Architecture in Detroit. In 1963, and uh, he stated that the data that they got from the study do not support that do not support the idea of teamwork. They just it, it doesn't. Uh, it's so it, which was very problematic because this was the time where Robius, that's what all he was talking about in all the pages. It was all about teamwork, uh, uh, but the the creative individual in a team lower his or her standards because the standards that that person has are so high that and, and the level of investment is such that when he or she sees someone that's less involved it kind of shuts down or it starts costing a lot and and that's why they, they go on their own uh, this is uh, for example the story of Ralph Rapson uh, Ralph Rapson had, uh, uh, had lost one of his arms uh, because he was born with a, with a, with a problem. He had a superb uh, um, draftsmanship. Uh, I mean, he drew very well. He lost his mother early. His father was very remote. Uh, he didn't know what to do with himself. Uh, and then he started, he realized that he liked to, to draw and then he liked, I mean, the girls liked him. So that created relevance for him. And he just then, boom, that's all he did. And that it, architecture became all his life, and uh, uh, so, so there are there are the, these experiences that are so unique uh, that that are 
profoundly uh, biographical, the autobiographical, and so it's hard to share that personal history with someone else who does perfectly an honorable job, because that's one thing I, I asked Ravenna. So are we saying that uh, unless you, you're kind of a, some kind of genius, so then your, your life is unworthy? I mean, it's perfectly fine to have a job from 9 to 5, you feed your family, and you play golf, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and she acknowledged that that was, a, I mean, there was an element of bias, that, that you're, you were, were trying to find some kind of superhuman recipe. But in the end, uh, uh, th this particular individual, he said, as of 1959, doesn't seem to be teamwork material. And uh, I mean, you're, I don't know if your dad was teamwork material, frankly. I mean, he must have worked with people, but ultimately it's always a Richard Neutcher project. It is sold as a Richard Neutcher project. And, and uh, the, the, the proper name create, mobilizes uh, uh, cultural and financial resources around which uh, a societal and the collective identities are formed. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, frankly, right, I had a ton of people working for him, but it was always a, a frankly, right project. Uh, there's no publishing house uh, that's our future books that does not want to have a book on frankly, right? It's a genre in its own right. So, it, and, and that is something that, uh, to me, has to be dealt with. But with what's fascinating in all these different personalities is that, for example, the office of Khan never really left a legacy, whereas the office of, uh, of Saarinen uh, gave rise to a lot of different practices. So there was something in that practice that allowed individuals to blossom, that they could only blossom once Nero died, because he would have never uh, given up the name of the firm, given this uh, emotional uh, struggle that he had with his father, that he acknowledged it. In this part. And that's why the, the, the creativity study is really illuminating because it enters into some of the dark aspects which we all have in some form, you know, the motivational structure. The, the motivation is why people do what they do. So it would have been interesting to see the fights of uh, Charles Eames, because Charles Eames was supposed to come, but then he, he couldn't. Um, I don't know, for example, Yamasaki, I know he was a traveled individual. A lot of had a drinking problem, and yet he, he, he did some marvelous work. How did he do that? You know, we don't know. All right. Thank you so much for coming.